daily Bible reading, we're in the book of Revelation. A controversial book. In fact, a book so controversial, scholars like John Calvin wouldn't touch it. They didn't want to write a commentary on it. And the same with many other scholars as well. Well, I'm going to tackle it. I've written a book on it called The Most Embarrassing Book in the Bible. I had some people who haven't read the, my book on it sort of attack me because it sounds like I think this book is embarrassing, and I don't. I actually think the way some people interpret it has caused embarrassment, so there's a bit of a distinction there. In fact, the title comes from something that C.S. Lewis said, and C.S. Lewis made the point that he found some of the end time statements in, in the scriptures to be embarrassing, and so I picked that up. Most embarrassing book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Need to give you just a little bit of background as way of introduction as we look at this book. Because what we're going to see here is this book was actually written to an audience. Now this is such a huge thing that if you can grasp that we approach the book of Revelation with exactly the same principles that we'd approach 1 Corinthians or Ephesians or the epistles of John in exactly the same way. We ask a question, who's he writing to? And he's actually writing to seven churches that were in Asia Minor at the time. Today we call that Turkey. And he was writing this epistle in around 65 AD. Now I know that there are people that will categorically state this was written around 95 AD. But there's firstly internal evidence to disprove that and internal evidence to prove that it must have been written around 65 AD. There's also historical evidence to show that this could not have been written after 70 AD. And the, the only reference to this, uh, historical reference to this being written in 95 AD is the fleeting reference that the author of this epistle, John, the writer of what's known as the Apocalypse, we call it in English the Revelation, was seen, was seen alive during the, the reign of Diocletian in AD 95. And from that, people have assumed that's when he wrote the epistle. And here's some of the internal evidence as to why this epistle was not written in AD 95. I'll go through it in sequential order. Firstly, John says he's their fellow prisoner, uh, fellow uh, believer in the midst of the tribulation. And we know that the persecution against the church began in 64 AD. And we know it ended, the first wave of massive persecution ended in 68 AD when Nero died. So we're already, we're into that time period. Secondly, in uh, Revelation chapter 6, it talks about the four horsemen. And each of those correspond, as I'll show you when we get to chapter 6, correspond to a Roman emperor. And then the next one, the next Roman emperor, who chronologically is Nero, He's not a military leader, and neither is the, 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 there's no, he, the fifth seal is not the rider of a horse because he's not a, a military leader. But it says with the opening of the fifth seal, the martyrs cried out. Well, the first wave of state-sponsored martyrdom occurred under the reign of Nero in 64 AD. There's the second clue. The third clue comes from Revelation chapter 11, where John is told, go and measure the temple. That's in Revelation chapter 11. Well, in 95 AD, there was no temple. There was no temple to measure. It had been destroyed in 70 AD. And another piece of evidence is taken from Revelation chapter 17, where in Revelation chapter 17, about verse 10, it says, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one now is. And if you count the kings, starting with Julius, Julius, who was the king of Rome, you go, Julius, Augustus, uh, Tiberius, uh, Caligula, Claudius, five have fallen, one now is, next one was Nero. So again, everything internally points to the period around about 65 AD. So that's why we say Revelation must have been written around 65 AD. Added to this is the, is the overall evidence that none of the Gospels refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. And why wouldn't they? Because Christ had given this outstanding prophecy. And just have a look at my videos on Matthew chapter 24 to see some of the background to this, that Jerusalem would be destroyed and its temple in particular would have been destroyed. And if it had happened in their lifetime, they would have noted it. There's no way you would write, say, the history of New York City without referring to the events of September 11. You just wouldn't do it. And in the same way, you wouldn't write the history of Jerusalem 
or refer to such an outstanding prophecy without citing its fulfilment. To write it after the events as if it was prophecy is to be deceitful, and there is no way the New Testament was practicing deceit. So this is some of the background to it. John has been a, a, a part of the, the persecution of Nero. He, they've attempted to boil him in oil. It hasn't worked. They've exiled him off the coast of Turkey to the island of Patmos. And while on Patmos, we read in the opening few chapters that he's in exile there, and clearly by chapter 11, he's off Patmos. So I want to read chapter 1. When we ask the question, what is this book about, the opening few words tell us plainly what this entire book is about. Let's read chapter 1. I'll make some comments as we go along the way. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant the things which must, note this, soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now here's the opening paragraph of Revelation chapter 1. You need to note immediately this language, soon and near. And it's just unbelievable. It's just nonsense to suggest that this could mean in 2,000 years these things will happen. That's just nonsense. So the first thing, John is writing to seven actual churches in Turkey that existed in 65 AD. He's telling them something is near, something is about to happen. That's how it reads. We're reminded that in Daniel, Daniel is told, seal up the words of this prophecy for they are a long time into the future. And that was only 300 years, three or 400 years. So that's a long time, and this is soon and near. I'm going to suggest to you it means what it means in ordinary language. Something was about to happen. Verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, or we might think of it as Asia Minor, grace to you and peace from him who is, who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. This is, this is a powerful reassurance in a time when it looked like the church was about to be obliterated and it looked like the entire gospel enterprise, Great Commission enterprise, had come to a grinding halt and was about to be obliterated. And here John is reminding them. And it's a revelation from Jesus to the church of who he is. This is, after all, the revelation of Jesus Christ. You read this book, you're supposed to grasp a greater revelation of who Jesus is. So this would have been very reassuring to the first century believers. We read on, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. Now, I know modern teachers and modern Bible prophecy pundits have made this sound like all the tribes of Africa India, Asia, and all the rest of it. But clearly, from a biblical perspective, this is the tribes of Israel. All the people of Israel will know that Israel has been judged very soon. That's what it's saying. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Right? Very important to connect who Alpha and Omega is, the first and the last. It's an expression used in the book of Isaiah as well. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and, and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in the furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters 
In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the seven angels are essentially what we would call the pastors of the churches, the messengers, and that's what angelos means, the messenger. Of course, it's not a heavenly angel. After all, who's John going to send the letter to? How's he going to post it? And if Christ wanted to get a message to his angels, he certainly wouldn't have used John. So these aren't heavenly celestial angels. These are angels in the sense of messengers or what we might call the pastors, the elders of, the, of these seven churches. And it's a, again, it's a beautiful picture. Christ is in the midst of the candlesticks. Christ is in the midst of his church. And he has seven candlesticks, each representing a church that shines a bright light, a light to the world. And that was Christ's commission. So in his eyes... The light that is the church in the world was not about to be obliterated. It was not about to be snuffed out. It was burning brightly. And Christ was in the midst of this bright light. It's an amazing revelation of who Jesus is, even in times when it doesn't look like he is who he says he is. So I want to pray, and we're going to, we're going to take some of the lessons that we've learned here, the, the majesty, the glory of Christ that we see, or even down to the detail of the burnished bronze feet, Burnished bronze is a picture in scripture of that which withstands judgment. It's what the altar had to be made out of because it was continually being burned uh, for the sacrifices. So every aspect of these details speaks of the, the work of Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us to gain a greater revelation of Jesus, that we can wonder at his majesty and glory and power, that we can rest in his sovereignty. Father, even when it seems like all hell is broken loose and everything's out of control, may we take great courage, great heart from the fact that Jesus is Lord. He's in the midst of the candlesticks. Your church is a candle burning brightly in a dark world. Help us to be a part of that flame that shares your love and grace and gospel and good news with a world that desperately needs it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this. We'll be back tomorrow with the next chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, as we start to look at the particular messages to the churches. If you like this, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed, hit that subscribe button. If you haven't bought my book about Revelation, grab that. Do yourself a favor. Cheaper than a Starbucks coffee. And you'll, you'll be really blessed, right? I'll see you tomorrow.